Um, and perhaps you already said this, but I'm just going to ask it again. Uh, you wrote on your blog, the digital turn in the arts, humanities and social sciences is not a fad, not a trend, but a responsibility. <laughs> yes. what, did, what did you mean by that? Well, I meant that um, digital media are not going to go away. Right? So we can say, yes, this idea that arts and humanities scholars are suddenly using Twitter and that's their digital turn, that does sound like a fad. Right? If you put it like that, it looks like something that people are going to do for a couple of years and then uh, you know, we're going to move back to what we traditionally do as arts and humanities scholars. Uh, but I think the fact that people use digital media in their everyday lives and in their politics and you know, um, in, 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 in little things, right? and that matters and it doesn't go away. I think arts and humanities scholars have a responsibility uh, on the one hand to try and figure out what is going on and what it means and on the other hand they have a responsibility to communicate to people in a way that they will understand. And what are the kind of questions you're interested in? Interested in? Um, well, there's a lot of different questions. My main question in the research project I'm doing right now is about how uh, communities change as people communicate online. So uh, my project is on digital nationalism in China. And uh, you know, I don't know if you've um, followed the kind of conflicts between China and some of its neighbors, for example, Japan. And there's a lot of nationalist debate going on uh, in online fora in China. Uh, and that's my, my focus. I want to find out how that works and what influence that has also on political processes more broadly. Um, but that's a practical, very direct question. Um, there's a lot of broader questions that are coming into focus also as you focus on digital media. Like, for example, um, does increased debate online facilitate participation in politics? That's a fundamental question, not just in China, also here. You know, do, do you get more democracy as people start talking about things on Facebook? Uh, and what does that mean for us as human beings as we're constantly tethered to the internet uh, and you know, to our social media and the Twitter and all that? Uh, does that change the way we interact with each other? And that's the kind of questions that I have in the background that are a bit larger. Uh, Digital humanities has become a kind of buzzword in, yeah. in the humanities. <laughs> um, uh, why do you think that is? Um, I think, well, I personally don't... Uh, I don't really like the term digital humanities, particularly because it's become such a buzzword, uh, but I like what it represents, I like what it's about. Uh, I think the reason it's become so popular is on the one hand that um, scholars in the arts and humanities are slowly realizing how important it is that we also get involved uh, in the kind of issues that people face in their daily lives as they use digital media, um, which is traditionally is there a tradition in digital media? I've, over the last 10 years or so, has evolved, I think, a bit more to be a social science subject. Um, and it's, it's increasingly clear that people are wondering, um, am, I, am I running out of time in my work because I constantly have to look at stuff up on my mobile phone? Uh, is the way I'm, I'm being observed by the state changing because everything is digital and available online? You know, what, what does that mean for me as a human being uh, that I'm constantly and differently in focus with uh, the kind of people I'm talking to? Uh, and I think that's, those are classical arts and humanities questions because it's really about you know, who are we as human beings. Uh, for some scholars, uh, digital humanities is the image of decline and stagnation. <laughs> what are they afraid, uh, afraid of? What's their biggest fear? It's a good question. You would have to ask them. Um, I can venture a guess. Uh, I think the worry is that we're becoming more superficial, um, that we're looking into, um, into human behavior in terms of only data. Right, that we're starting to quantify what people do, uh, which is a, a very classic critique uh, of how modernity works, right? That we're all just you know, cogs in the machinery. And the digital systems that we live in might be exactly part of that machinery. So by saying academia should now also um, not just look into how that works, but also maybe use digital media as its tools, aren't we selling out, right? Aren't we selling out the idea of traditional scholarship, which thinks, uh, you know, which, which uh, reflects more and takes the time to think rather than becoming part of this treadmill that digital media seem to be bringing about. And I think that's part of what the concern is. Um, if that's the case, I don't, I don't think it's all that warranted. I mean, there's good reasons to criticize critical, uh, uh, it's a good reason to criticize digital media and digital media usage, but I think that's exactly what the arts and humanities should be doing. And I think that's what digital, good digital humanities scholarship also does. Earlier you said it's not only important that the social sciences do research on uh, digital culture, but also the humanities. Yeah. Uh, when you look at your own field, so um, uh, 
uh, digital nationalism. Yeah. Uh, what kind of question would a social scientist ask and what are the kind of questions you uh, ask <laughs> as a humanities scholar? The social sciences um, are very good at asking questions of what something is like, what's going on, how does it work and why. And they've developed a, a range of very useful tools in order to explore these questions. And that means that they're very systematic, um, they're very clear about what counts as data, what counts as the information we use, and at making that, uh, the research available in ways that other people can later check up on us and say, actually, that person did a good job, or you know, I'm going to check a different question with that same data. And I think all of this is valuable. Um, I think the arts and humanities are very good at asking broader questions and asking, you know, not just you know, what, what, what is it, what is going on, but what does it mean? Uh, and also putting things into perspective philosophically, historically. Uh, as an area study scholar, one of the questions I'm interested in is how much does place matter? You know, where is here? When I'm studying China, does it actually matter that the processes I'm looking at are in China? Or would the same processes happen in the United States? You know, what are these kind of cultural differences? Um, can we, how can we be sensible to these things and acknowledge them? Uh, and I think good social scientists also ask these questions, but traditionally, arts and humanities scholars are very good at providing that kind of rich context. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that my research kind of draws from both fields. And when we're talking about the methods uh, you apply, um, what kind of methods do you use when studying uh, national, uh, digital nationalism? <laughs> In the digital nationalism uh, project that I'm doing, I'm mapping out parts of the Chinese web. Uh, for example, uh, all the websites that deal with um, the Nanjing massacre of 1937, right? Because I'm interested in Chinese-Japanese relations. The it, Nanjing massacre, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's um, sort of a, a Holocaust-like event in China, which is a very, very major um, uh, event, very important also for um, you know, a sense of patriotism and community in China, um, following the Japanese invasion during World War II. Uh, well, um, reportedly 300,000 people were massacred in the city of Nanjing, the former capital of China at the time. Uh, and it's still an issue today, um, particularly because the impression in China is that the Chinese government isn't acknowledging its role and its responsibility in this event. So there's a lot of websites that are educating about this particular um, national history event. Uh, and that are retelling that story. And I'm interested to find out you know, who are the institutions behind these websites, but also what kind of materials are they using, right? What kind of photos are they putting online and who are they drawing from, who are they linking to in the discussions? Uh, and when you do that, you can find out very quickly um, that when you zoom out a little bit, uh, you see that there's actually not all that much discussion between these websites and websites outside of China. So the idea that the web sort of creates this um, this place that has no ge geography to it is not true. Um, you can show that it's a confined Chinese space. And when you zoom out a little bit more, you can actually show how these websites are tied to the government uh, and how a lot of the information flows through um, the state council, which is China's cabinet, and their website. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is designed by the government. That's not the case. Uh, but it shows how the infrastructure of the Chinese web uh, is, is managed, you know, what it looks like. Uh, so that macro perspective. And that's the kind of thing that digital methods can show us. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I'm doing right now. You were talking about the more philosophical questions humanity scholars uh, can ask. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what are the more philosophical questions uh, you ask uh, regarding your field of study? So. Um, well, one of the, the broader theoretical questions um, is whether or not people participate more in politics uh, once they get to communicate uh, in these social digital networks. Uh, and one of the assumptions seems to be that uh, societies become more democratic as communication becomes more open. Uh, and that's it's a story that a lot of us want to believe, and it's a nice story. Uh, there's a lot of information now available that suggests that may not be the entire story. Uh, so you see things like the so-called Arab Spring, for example, as a revolution that was supposedly tweeted um, and you also see the aftermath, wondering, you know, does that mean that digital media have now created democracies? That's what happened there. Uh, and in the Chinese case, this is a very, very important question, right? Because you have people involved uh, in changes, very, very profound changes in Chinese politics, uh, which are involved in digital communication. So does that mean we need to think about digital communication as something that creates these changes or something that's being used to make these changes? And do technologies in themselves already have you know, some kind of property that makes them liberation technologies? Or can you also use these technologies in quite sinister ways, right? To, to monitor people or to follow up on what they're saying and, and, and what does that mean? 
so these are the kind of philosophical questions about, you know, how do human beings interact? <laughs> and does that change when you have digital communication available or not? So it's an open question. I don't have an answer. Uh, I personally think there's much more continuity in what we do as societies and as human beings. Uh, but I do think... Continuity... Uh, between, you know, how people have always communicated. Uh, to me personally, I think the, the mass communication age where you have, you know, the BBC or something just, you know, broadcasting to the masses uh, one particular story and then people take that story away and they discuss it, you know, over dinner or in, in a bar. But there's sort of like a disconnect between the mass media system and what people then do with that information. Uh, I think that is essentially it's it's the odd man out right that's kind of a, a phase in, in history and that's a bit strange and I'm wondering whether with the digital communication available and the way that people are now able to connect more easily we're back to um, you know kind of a, a new take on face-to-face -face communication and people discussing things in marketplaces and, and, and you know shouting at each other more loudly not always in good ways but you know it's it's a departure from just one source or a small amount of sources of information that people then just you know take as the, the accredited source for fact. Uh, and I think we now have situations where people talk back to um, media, um, to, to these media organizations where they exchange information is parallel to them or just develop you know, sources for information on their own, like you know, citizens, journalists, uh, bloggers, uh, who would do things that weren't possible 20 or 30 years ago. So we have seen that uh, the emergence of uh, digital technology has changed um, your research field, the questions, the methods, the topics, um, but it has also changed um, the position of scholars and what yeah. scholars can use as tools. Um, what, tool, what tools do you use as scholar to commun communicate yeah. your research? Uh, well, I. I um I think it would be disingenuous to study digital media and not actually use them. <laughs> I mean, what would that say about me, right? It would be a bit hypocritical. Uh, I, I've tried to create my own website uh, for my research to show people you know, what it is I'm doing. Uh, but I also, one of the things I get most excited about is how we can use digital media to also teach. Um, well, two things, to teach, so that's something that um, is valuable for our students, but also to uh, talk about the things we're doing with a broader audience, um, with journalists, for example, or just you know, people in the public who are interested in, for example, China, uh, and who can now, in much easier ways, connect with us as scholars. So it really tears down this cliche of the ivory tower scholar. Um, and maybe just to give you an example, uh, I am on Twitter, for instance, and I you know, send out all the things that I'm doing, and you know, I'm reading this book, and I'm really liking this lecture, and things like that. Uh, and I had a, a student uh, from Ireland, uh, who contacted me out of the blue and said, yeah, I really like what you're doing. And uh, the social media dynamic already makes sure that that student now doesn't have to feel he's talking to this assistant professor, you know, dun, dun, dun. But he's actually just talking to someone else on Twitter. And he said, you know, I, I'm wondering whether I can do a discourse analysis on something on Ireland. What are you doing on China? And I said, you know, this is cool. You know, tell me your questions. And we started emailing. And I just got a tweet from him yesterday saying, you know, I just graduated. And thank you for your advice. This was really helpful. And I think these are the kind of interactions that you're increasingly seeing now that we're more visible um, in digital media. And it, it's, it's more fun also for students and for people in the public to then interact with us and say, actually, I disagree with you, or why are you saying this, and let's have a debate about it.